Happy Tuesday. Today's presentation is going to be about how to keep your heart healthy. All right. So our agenda today, we're going to talk a little bit about cardiovascular disease, the prevalence, what maybe your personal hurdle is, cardiometabolic food plan in terms of the integrative and functional medicine, and then exercise stress. So those will be the things that we're going to cover in terms of topics. So what is cardiovascular disease? It includes coronary heart disease, stroke, hypertension, and rheumatic heart disease. So when you're looking at, I'm sure each and every one of you listening to this presentation right now has been touched or someone you know has been touched by issues with cardiovascular health. The most common form is atherosclerotic disease of the heart and vascular system. This is where you can see this picture here down on the right-hand side of the screen where you've got the blocked artery, the plaque buildup formation here on the right. Here's a normal artery, and this is over time what happens. The um, progressive accretion of plaque on the vessel walls and the blood flow is decreased. So obviously there's less space here, which makes it more difficult to pass blood through. So when narrowing occurs in a vessel, so atherosclerosis, a blood clot can get lodged and blood flow can be stopped completely. Obviously this would cause a huge issue. So the tissues downstream and the other areas that the blood isn't getting to will then die and a heart attack can occur. So what is the prevalence? Uh, these stats are a little bit on the older side, but 2,400 Americans die of cardiovascular disease each day. That's one every 37 seconds. Coronary heart disease caused one of a, out of every five deaths. So again, a little old here in the US at 2004. While heart attack deaths have declined dramatically, the hospital admissions, so the incidence of the events have not. Cardiovascular disease is preventable. Uh, it can be treated with alterations in nutrition and diet, exercise, and overall lifestyle habits. I thought this was interesting. I found this um, from an article. During World War II, there was a sharp decline in cardiovascular disease. Thoughts due to the scarcity of sugar and other components in the diet, as well as restrictions on gasoline, forcing people to travel by foot. So less sugar, more movement. There's a clue there. So just kind of reinstating the things that I said before, one of every three deaths caused by heart disease each year and 39 seven, uh, seconds. Okay, so what is your own personal biggest hurdle? Are you someone who can't stop smoking? Uh, and that's increasing your risk for cardiovascular disease. Are you someone who has high blood pressure and you're having a hard time managing it and getting it under control? Uh, do you have high cholesterol or high LDL particles uh, and the LDL particle size being really small. If you haven't heard of particle testing, many times uh, you'll get a panel done for a fasting uh, cholesterol test. And a lot of times it will come back uh, indicative saying, oh, you have high cholesterol. However, there's much more to this story. You need to look at the size of the LDL particles because it can be risky or it can cause uh, be a higher of higher risk if your particles are small, and it can be low risk if your LDL particles are large and fluffy. I don't exercise regularly. Maybe movement is a barrier for you. Keeping up with your meds is difficult, depending upon what you're on, what you're taking, or being on medication. And stress. This is one of the biggest factors. We'll talk at the very end today, but one of is the biggest contributing factor in my mind. Um, of everything, every known disease and inflammation, inflammatory condition in the body, and um, really for cardiovascular disease too. So stopping smoking and improving your food choices. So there are a number of programs out there. Uh, if you go to your local hospital, there are smoking sensation station classes that you can look up and even most of them are free. Some of them reward you for stopping smoking. This is a, a big deal and something that you should definitely look into if this is a hurdle for you. Highly, highly encourage you. We all know that smoking is not good for you. Um, tobacco smoke we're talking about here. And um, just if this is you, I encourage you to use this as your sign to look into making, uh, breaking this habit. Okay, how can diet help lower blood pressure? So we're gonna look at that today while we talk a little bit about the Mediterranean diet and the modified approach here. Eating vegetables with every meal. Look for colorful plants like dark leafy greens, orange carrots, purple berries. The vibrancy of the colors designates the, the type of antioxidant 
that that plant has. Add a fistful or two each meal. If you're not having any vegetables in your day, this is a good conversation starter. Um, and this category of food provides medicinal compounds that can ward off cardiometabolic disease. So like I was saying, antioxidants. Try vegetables, uh, not typically eaten, aiming for eight to 12 servings per day. Now, when I'm talking about that, that could be half a cup of something. In microgreens, that could be a quarter cup of that. Uh, for uh, cooked down greens, that could be a half a cup of, you know, two cups cooked down. So the portion size here, you're thinking, oh my gosh, eight to 12 servings per day. That can sound like a lot, and, and it does. Uh, but that has been seen to show the greatest results in per protecting uh, from cardiometabolic disease. A serving, like I said, is half a cup of cooked vegetables or one cup of raw leafy greens. Okay, legumes. So this is, again, part of the modified Mediterranean diet. Five times a week, a quarter cup is a serving. Many times people will go all ham out on these beans and have like a full cup. I'm just talking about quarter cup serving size. That's four tablespoons. So foods like beans, lentils, chickpeas, which are high in fiber, can bind to cholesterol in the digestive tract and start to sweep out. It serves as a broom. Uh, if you eat grains uh, or gluten-free grains, so we're talking about brown or wild sprouted rice, sprouted bread instead of white bread. We know that there's more fiber in the whole form of the grain, oats, whole grain oats, instead of your regular breakfast cereal. Breakfast cereal is stripped of so many nutrients and has so much sugar added to it. Healthy fats, I talk about healthy fats a lot with my one-on-one -on -one coaching clients, adding in nuts and seeds and fatty fish and avocado and olive oil. And really these types of fats and the variety of these fats and changing it up can really help lower the small particle LDLs and help raise HDLs. HDLs is that protective cholesterol, protective form of cholesterol. So you have your total cholesterol and then you have a ratio of LDL and HDL. And there's a ratio that you'd be, uh, you'd be given on a lab result. Fruits and vegetables. So fruit and vegetable intake, I know we talked about eight to 12 servings. So at least five servings a day is associated with a lower risk of cardiovascular disease. Fruit and vegetable intake is associated with lower blood pressure. And then a greater blood pressure effect is due to higher potassium content. What I mean by that is a greater lowering effect. So a lot of times people will solely focus on sodium and it's really not the bad guy all the time here. Most of the time, it's really a low potassium intake that is really creating this counterbalance um, and creating the high blood pressure. So what I encourage you to do is look at more potassium rich foods and how you can add that into your diet. Also limited evidence for an inverse trend between the fruit and vegetables consumption and the LDL levels. And greater LDL lowering effects is due to soluble fiber and plant-based sterols. So soluble fiber is a form of fiber that doesn't get digestible, fiber doesn't get digested in the gut, but again, can help with really lowering LDL because it has that nature of sweeping, sweeping out um, the bad cholesterol, getting it rerouted and then excreted. Okay, let's talk a little bit about low glycemic index and glycemic load. So what are these terms? Have you heard of them? What do they mean? And should they really be paying attention, any attention to? The glycemic index and glycemic load are similar but different. So glycemic index is basically a measure of how much of a spike that your blood sugar will elevate given an intake of a certain food. The glycemic load is what factors in the amount of the food um, and, and the effects of the blood sugar raising effect. So you can see here on the right hand side, you may be given the same food, but depending upon the portion size and the amount can change the actual level of the glycemic index and the glycemic load. Not all foods have the same impact on blood sugar and insulin. So ideally blood sugar should remain relatively constant. Uh, I think it's a misnomer that, oh, we should have huge rises and huge falls. No, you really want it to stay a little bit more even keel. Uh, without huge spikes, because that can cause insulin to surge, because there's always a chain reaction. High glucose causes high insulin, um, unless you have an insulin uh, insensitivity or um, lack there of production of insulin. So that's more in the diabetes world. And to, to have that surge uh, in order to shuttle sugar into the tissues that need it. So like your muscles and your liver, and when you exercise, your body needs to push the sugar or the carbohydrate really into the cells 
to be used for what's called the energy system. So it's within the mitochondria of the cell. Without getting too sciencey here, it's basically just a carrier or a pusher into the cell. And when you have a lot of sugar, that means you have, a, have to have a lot more insulin, which can cause a lot more inflammation. Okay, glycemic index, glycemic load can be measured on foods that contain carbohydrates. And high glycemic load and glycemic index are associated with significant increased risk of cardiovascular disease, specifically for women. It is optimal to eat foods that have a GI of 55 or less. Again, remember glycemic index, glycemic load. There's been some studies that look at glycemic index as like it doesn't even pertain. But when we're looking at the load, the amount that you're eating, it does make a difference. It does impact the amount of insulin and blood sugar ratio and then overall impact on your arteries, your, uh, your muscles, your tissues, your organs, because they have to respond and they have to cope with the things that you're intaking. So some examples of some low glycemic index food includes kidney beans, lentil, lentils, chickpeas like legumes because they have high fiber, nuts like almonds and walnuts, seeds, pumpkin, flax, and sesame, the most intact grains like oats, barley, and spelt. So again, intact meaning less processing occurring, and most vegetables and fruits, peaches, berries, berries being um, high, lower in sugar and higher in fiber. Medium GI foods, uh, if, if that food has a higher... If a food is higher in GI uh, is eaten, eat them together with a protein fat. So this is what I talk about a lot with my one-on-one -on -one coaching clients. I talk about balance. I talk about pairings and specifically to each person individually, what that looks like in terms of portion size. So it changes. Uh, that's why I don't have any specific information because I would have to look at your needs specifically, your activity, your sleep, your stress, your um, amount of hours that you're up in the day, your schedule, your uh, food intake currently, food intake should be like, not should, I shouldn't say that word, but overall, there's not a one size fits all. So when we're looking at this, it's really in, in incorporating balance and pairing foods together. Okay, let's talk a little bit about regular eating times. So I'm going to talk a little back and forth to this one. Um, one thing I want to point out is that we don't want to feel like we have to be so concrete when I, when I say regular eating times, that, oh, it's eight o'clock, I have to eat totally ignoring and negating hunger cues. This is not what I'm saying here. What I'm trying to, uh, to shed some light on here is that it should take about four hours. Like you shouldn't feel like you have to eat another meal two hours after you just ate a meal. And that comes with balance, that comes with understanding the pairings of foods, that comes also with understanding a little bit more about your body type and activity and what you need for you. So take note of your energy level. Sometimes it's, that's a good cue too. If you're feeling like you have a heavy meal and all of a sudden you're feeling exhausted and fatigued and you can't, and you can't function at your optimal level for the rest of the day, that's a pretty good indication that maybe that meal was really high in carbohydrates and you don't have enough um, proteins and veggies and fiber and fats to sustain you instead of having a high blood sugar and then a low blood sugar drop or uh, getting you back down sugar drop. Balanced meal result in feeling more satisfied, clear-headedness, ability to focus, and sufficient energy. One hour later, are you still feeling hunger, or feeling brain fog, if you're feeling shaky or fatigued, and maybe you'll mean that the meal was missing something. So just like what I said, like protein or fat or whole foods. And then the low blood sugar symptoms can be a response to eating foods with a high glycemic load or foods that are not tolerated well. So this could be, again, another indication of hidden food sensitivities. And I've talked about this in some of my other videos, but food sensitivities and GI and gut-related issues are a big deal and something not to be ignored. So if you're really in tune with your body and symptoms that you experience, this is something to get help about to talk to a registered dietitian. Um, I would love to talk with you more about it because again, it's going to change the way you live your life. It's going to change the way that you feel in your skin every day. You may be feeling right now like, oh, I'm just going to be here. Like this is just, this is just the best as it gets. I can tell you that I've had so many clients that are like, Ashley, I can't even believe that you could feel this way because I feel so different now that we've changed up the way I eat and some of my lifestyle habits. And this is now my new norm. And if I go back to doing what I was doing before, man, I really felt terrible. I didn't realize how terrible I felt. Okay. High in fiber. So let's talk a little bit about fiber. 
Along with the glycemic load and the glycemic index, eating whole, relatively unprocessed foods also helps to take in more dietary fiber and less added sugar. So this is where we talk a little bit about the non-digestible components about fiber. So inside of a fiber is usually found in the brand, the outer coat, or of like an apple. You've got the inside that's the soluble and the outside that's the insoluble. This type of fiber acts like a bulking, so it's an inner broom, what I was talking about before, that sweeping through your gut and helping um, cut out debris from the intestine, creating more motility and movement, which is a good thing for lowering those bad cholesterol numbers and um, helping your cardiovascular health. Soluble fiber is what helps pull in, attract water and swells, creates like a gel-like mass. I always think of soluble fiber kind of like a chia seed. A chia seed, you put it in water and it gels up and it really increases about three times or maybe even more than its size um, from when it starts off. And so think about that as soluble fiber. It's really absorbing the liquid. The soluble fiber in foods like oat bran, barley, nuts and seeds, beans, lentils, peas, and some fruits and vegetables act to slow digestion. So what are the benefits of helping slow down digestion? Keeping you full and satiated for longer, not having to eat as often or eat within that four hours from when you last ate something. Again, and I'm not talking about specifically for athletes here. That's a whole other story when we're talking about feeding and fueling the body in terms of exercise and needs for performance. So when I'm saying four hours, I'm saying for the average Joe, for those who are just active and exercising, um, but not competing. Okay, psyllium. The main ingredient of common fiber supplements is the soluble fiber. You'll, you'll hear that, a psyllium fiber or a supplement of psyllium. Uh, helping to slow the release of glucose from food into the blood. So the pairing again helps to ward off the spikes in blood sugar that we talked about before. So really keeping the levels more even, which can again help to prevent cardiometabolic disease. Soluble fiber traps in the toxins, other undesirable components, including cholesterol we talked about and dietary fats in the gut and really helps to carry them to excrete out to the body. While this is also providing food, for healthy bacteria in the digestive tract. So the bacteria meaning your um, probiotics, so your, your bacteria lining, um, and that's another topic for another time, but just a, a short snippet there. Aim for at least five grams of fiber per serving of a food as this is considered an excellent level of fiber. Um, and really more so at least 25 to 30 grams of fiber per day. Okay, low in simple sugars. This is a big one too. Added sugars contribute to a significant portion of calorie in the American diet. We know this, pop, sweeten, any sweetened beverages, um, any sugar added to anything, any processed foods. So eating refined grades and foods with refined sugar has been positively associated with several cardiovascular risk factors, including elevated triglycerides. This is a big one. Elevated triglycerides are not something to to just let go by the wayside. This is it's something that is changeable over time, but should not be ignored. Uh, low good cholesterol. So if you have a diet that's high in simple carbohydrates or simple sugars, it tends to lower your HDL. And that's the protective cholesterol, the one that we want a little bit higher. Also can decrease insulin sensitivity. So if you have decreased insulin sensitivity, that makes it more challenging for your body to actually get the glucose into the cells and you end up running a higher uh, level of blood sugar in the long run. Which again, having high levels of blood sugar can lead to other things like diabetes and cause other issues um, and damage arteries. Refined sugars are prevalent in sodas, fruit drinks, pre-sweetened teas, coffee drinks, energy, sports drinks, flavored milks, the list can go on and on forever. It is essential to refrain from added sweeteners as much as possible when following a heart healthy diet. High intensity sweeteners, let's touch on this, can lead to blood sugar imbalances. Uh, it can also increase calories and subsequent weight gain and continue cravings. When we have something that is high in sweetness, and again, I did a talk about this not too long ago on, on sugar and sugar versus fat. And when we have an intake of sweet things, we tend to want more. It's an addictive spike in dopamine in the brain that then want, causes us to want to continue to have more and more and more until you get to the point where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm fed up with having this much sweetness in my diet. But anyways, um, it can also lead to those imbalances. And that's something that we want to try to avoid to really help you reach optimal health. 
Okay, I'll talk a little bit about balanced quality fats. So this is just a table here. Uh, I wanted to showcase here at the bottom. So we'll go to the bottom of the, this chart here with me. Many vegetable oils are rich in polyunsaturated fats. I wanna highlight this green bar here. Um, polyunsaturated fats, yes, while I feel like saturated fats have, have gotten deemed as very negative, while we do need them in our diet and um, a variety of healthy fats is really what's key in optimizing health here. I want to highlight this one specifically, omega-6. Omega-6 is something that has been used over and over, especially in processed foods, especially foods that have higher in carbohydrates and foods that are um, processed, like in the packaged form. So if you look down here, cottonseed oil, soybean oil, corn oil, sunflower oil, these are probably the most four or the, the four that are used the most in terms of processing, like chips and candies and cakes and really a, a lot of processed foods. And so with, with the rise of, of those foods being taken in with people or um, consumed, we saw that in the 1960s, there was a lower of fat intake and there was a rise in more carbohydrate rich processed foods while these foods still had omega-6 rich foods in them and they still do to this day which again omega-6 can be more cardiometabolic it um, can cause negative effects to cardiovascular health because it's more inflammatory when we have polyunsaturated fats like omega-3 here we've got the nice yellow for the flaxseed oil as our most that again that's an oil that should be kept cold not heated because uh, the omega-3s are very heat sensitive. But now you have something that's, that's much more protective. That's why we talk about like eating healthy uh, fatty fish. That's why we talk about eating nuts and seeds that are more rich in uh, omega-3. Now you can see here too, another one, canola oil, peanut oil. These are also more green, more green here. Olive oil is less, little, has mostly monounsaturated fats. So just think in terms of when you've got more omega-6, that's going to be more dangerous for your heart health when you've got more monounsaturated, more polyunsaturated. Um, those are going to be more heart healthy. Okay, that, that could be a topic in itself, like an entire hour discussion. So uh, let me know if you have any questions about that. Okay, we'll touch briefly on this, target calories. Now, with my clients, sometimes we don't even talk about calories. Sometimes we talk about just really fueling your body for nourishment, really aligning that space that you need in terms of how much, how often, what corresponds with activity. And sometimes I remind people, what did people do when they didn't have uh, you know, all the apps that we have today? How on earth did they eat? How did they maintain their weight? So just thinking about that for a hot second, but we do talk about it sometimes with my clients too. So when we're looking at total calorie intake, we're looking at body weight, basal metabolic rate, activity level, cardio, cardio metabolic risk factor. Um, I'm looking at pre-diagnosis. I'm looking at gut health. I'm looking at um, how stress is a factor, how sleep is a part of their, you know, how much they sleep. So there's a lot of targeted things that we look at in terms of overall calorie intake, which actually determine, all those things determine this. Uh, and a plan really is specific and individualized, um, not only to food groups and servings, but also can help you specifically lose weight, achieve cardiometabolic balance, but it's very specific to you. Again, like I said, there's so many factors that go into this. So um, as a registered dietitian and a personal trainer, I work with my clients very closely to determine again, what's going to fit and suit your needs in terms of talking about calories, talking about overall balance um, and really what your body needs and what your health, based on what your health goals are. Okay, I'm gonna very briefly touch on some top supplements for heart health. This is again, always food first method, but sometimes there is a need for supplementation. So we talked a little bit about the health of omega-3 fatty acids before when I was talking about the hindrance of omega-6, kind of its counterpart in the polyunsaturated position there. But fish oil supplementation, if this is something, if you feel, um, if you're not following a vegan or veg, uh, vegetarian lifestyle, uh, four grams per day for about six plus weeks was shown, this is a study, shown to reduce pro-inflammatory molecules. I usually look at a two grams per day in terms of fish oil supplementation with my clients. Um, again, totally dependent, different for everybody. So don't take that, take that with a grain of salt. Fish, uh, salmon, and herring, really salmon 
it's low in mercury, especially if it's wild caught Alaskan salmon or just wild caught salmon. Um, three ounces, five times a week. This is another study looked at eight weeks, shown to significantly reduce lower levels of pro inflammatory molecules in people with dyslipidemia. Dyslipidemia is just a fancy word for saying when your cholesterol is high or cholesterol numbers are out of whack. Okay, ALA, I'm going to just highlight this. So, chia seeds, walnuts, canola oil, flaxseed. I talked about canola oil before. So, this is really not what it can have an influence on inflammatory process, but it's really not the thing that makes the biggest difference. EPA and DHA coming from fish and algae and more of our seafood uh, appears to be definitely more sustainably effective in terms of anti-inflammatory effects. Okay, another one here, red yeast rice. Modulates blood lipids favorably and naturally, reduces microbes known to play a role in cardiovascular disease. Again, always check in with your doctor or talk to your dietitian, whoever you're working with in terms of the supplement, supplementation is appropriate for you. Protects the arterial lining to prevent atherosclerotic lesions that lead to heart attack. So um, when we talked about before the plaque buildup, that was what that is. And then reduces inflammation and oxidative stress, both known to be associated with heart disease. Favorably alters CRP, so a inflammatory marker, blood glucose, HDL, and triglycerides. And again, everybody is different. So again, this is just one dose recommendation, but it may be different specifically for you. Okay, red yeast rice again here. So to reduce side effects such as muscle pain, here, I, I am a huge promoter of doing things as naturally as possible. If, we, if you don't have to be on a statin and we can get you off that drug, oh man, I, that's, that's the best thing ever because statins can really increase nerve issues, can increase muscle pain, joint pain, um, can do all sorts of things. We, we really we want to get you off drugs when they're um, not necessary and really choose lifestyle behavior changes. And red yeast rice is, is a natural component. So yes, it is a supplement, but it's an alternative way to lower your cholesterol before using statin drugs. and something you can talk to your doctor or dietitian about. Those who encounter negative effects from taking niacin. So this is um, niacin a lot of times is also, this is a completely separate supplement, but it's sometimes used to, to help reduce um, lipid levels, so cholesterol levels, but sometimes it can cause this flushing of the face so people feel really hot from intake of niacin. So that's why red yeast rice, again, would be encouraged instead of niacin, is what I'm saying. Um, also to help metabolic syndrome. If you have a strong family history of heart disease, this is something that you may have already talked to your doctor about in taking a proactive approach. All right, how much exercise do you need to keep your heart healthy? A mixture of cardio resistance training helps to really lower cholesterol. If you do something little every day, even 20 minute walk after a meal can help reduce triglyceride levels. Also sugar. Work up to five hours a week with a mix of low to high intensity activity, including weights, intervals, low intensity cardio. Based on wherever you're at, with my clients, sometimes I, I have worked with clients who are, have never exercised or just starting an exercise routine, and we talk about really building this up slowly. Maybe just a, a small walk would be enough to make an impact. Or if you're an avid exerciser, maybe it's changing up, hey, I always do this routine, or I always do cardio, I never do weights, or I always do weights and I never do cardio. Um, it's about the balance there. It's about the mix. All right, stress. All right, here we go. Stress, the risk of heart disease, 40%. The risk of heart attack, 25%. The risk of stroke, look at that, 50%. Stress is a big factor of heart health. Your heart beats, not only with the blood that is pumped in and out of it, but beats for every thought you have, for every hormone that is translated into from a thought, for every... Um, increase in you know, uh, anxiety or fear, that impacts your heart. Your heart is a working muscle, obviously. Um, this is just a little activity, deep breathing for heart health. Um, so why well, I wanna talk a little bit more about stress. Again, this could be a topic all in itself that can really have a role or um, increase a lot of different varieties of diseases, especially when we're talking about inflammation. I'd like to do a segment just solely specifically talking about stress, and I have before, and if you uh, are not currently a part of 
the Facebook group that we're in. So that's Move Fully Nourished with Ashley Anderson, myself. Um, and there we talk about a lot of different things. And we have these Tuesday trainings. But we also talk about a lot of a variety of topics, but questions that come up often in my one-on-one -on -one coaching clients are really stress-induced. Um, this happened and then that led to food eating. This happened and then I didn't exercise. This happened and then I didn't sleep all night. So stress impacts every part of your ability to improve your health. And this, again, like I said, is a topic all in itself, but really can impact overall heart health and cardiovascular disease. So hope you all enjoyed this cardiovascular presentation and how to keep your heart healthy. And I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much for joining me.